All right, so uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yeah, sir. We can hear. Yep, sure can. What we're gonna do is we're gonna work the problems for, uh, for the curve number lecture, which is lecture 34. I'm gonna keep my video off because I think uh, it'll make uh, your experience a little better. I'm having a little bit of bandwidth problems on the, on the uh, internet here, but this is the table that's in your textbook, table 8.7.3. And this is where we're gonna select our curve numbers. And each one of these curve numbers uh, on here is for antecedent moisture condition two, which is that middle value of antecedent moisture condition. And if we have a different antecedent moisture condition, remember there was a, a table for that in the lecture uh, that talked about if it was the uh, growing uh, dar dormant season, less than a half an inch was uh, AMC one, uh, between half an inch and an inch and a half, I think is AMC two. You'll have to look at that table. But uh, that is all about the antecedent moisture conditions. And so we'll work a couple problems here. We're gonna be picking values off of this and adjusting them accordingly to different uh, aspects. So let's see here, let's get rid of this. Move that. So our first, uh, first problem is uh, determine the curve number for residential area on a sandy loam soil with average lot size of three quarter acre, no, I'm sorry, one quarter acre, uh, which is a hundred by a hundred feet lot size, so not very big, of uh, antecedent moisture condition one. So we're gonna go to the table and we're looking for a uh, quarter acre lot size. And here we are right there. And we've got a, you can see over here that we have some choices to make. Is it average imperviousness 38%? We haven't made any comment about that. So we'll assume it's an okay uh, uh, assumption. And then we've got to, to look at, okay, which of the soil uh, groups are we in? And so we're in a sandy clay loam, right? That was what we said was a sandy, I'm sorry, sandy loam soils. And you will notice uh, that uh, on, on the table in the, in the uh, textbook that that would uh, classify as either soil group B or C, uh, either way would fit in there. So uh, I'm gonna do it both ways. So using um, soil group B, if we go over to table 8.7.3 for that, we have soil group B, you can see I'd pick off a 75 value for that. If we had soil group C, it's gonna be an 83. And so if I go through there, I can pick off for that soil group B, I've got 75 is my curve number for antecedent moisture condition two that curve number is equal to 75. So I'm gonna to have to adjust that. I know that because I've, I've told you that we're at antecedent moisture condition one and using soil group C, I had a curve number for antecedent moisture condition two, that's going to be 83. So I go in and I do my conversion. If I wanna to go to curve number uh, for antecedent moisture condition one, that equation I gave you in the lecture yesterday is 4.2 times 75, which is the curve number for antecedent moisture condition two, divided by 10 minus 0 0.058 times the 75, or I get a curve number of 56. That's just rounded off. For the um, curve number one, for the uh, soil group C, I just do the same thing. 4.2 times 83, 10 minus 0 0.058 times 83, or I get a value of 67. So you can see there is some disparate uh, uh, values here 
depending on whether I characterize it as a soil group uh, A, or I'm sorry, B or C. And so typically what you would do if it was that big of a question is you would run your analysis with both curve numbers and, and see how they, they turn out. Any questions on the first uh, problem or first example? Dr. Holmes? Yes. Um, I know you said that uh, when it's a big question, you just run both groups, but in reality, how important or like determining which one to use, like how do you go about that way? Well, uh, that's why I said you're, you're going to basically use, I would do the analysis on both and see how sensitive that parameter, the analysis is to the, the uh, curve number. So I would run the analysis twice. So I would run through this and run the rainfall runoff a method, get my precip excess, enter that into my NRCS model and come up with a, an answer at the end, you know, what the hydrograph looks like and then what the hydrograph looks like with the other curve number. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're not just after the hydrograph, you're going to be designing a, you know, a stormwater detention basin, or you're going to take that peak discharge that you generate and run a step back water model on it to see what elevation does that correspond to uh, on, in the river channel, you know, that we, we, there's a couple of ways we can go with, you know, what we're actually looking to design here. But I would use both curve numbers if, if you're that uncertain about it, whether it's a soil group B or C, you, you know, the, all these modeling things, you're always going to do sensitivity analysis to figure out how sensitive are the, is the parameters that you're picking. Because again, all models are wrong. Some are better than others, right? And part of that uh, aspect of uh, doing the analysis is looking at how sensitive your assumptions are. Uh, the final answer, how sensitive is the final answer to your assumptions? Make sense? Yes. Okay. Next problem is uh, determine a curve number for industrial park. or not park, but district on aggregated silt soils with 60% impervious area that is fully hydraulically connected. And that means uh, no adjustment needed for some of the impervious area disconnected. So what do I mean there is, remember we talked about if it's not hydraulically connected, if you've got like your, your uh, gutters on your roof, if they're not connected out onto the impervious driveway and then out into the guttering of the street, if, they, if your gutters off your house run out into the yard into a pervious area, well, that's not hydraulically connected. So you have to make an adjustment. And we had the adjustment was using this graph here. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll have one of these problems where we have to make that adjustment. But for this case, we're not going to, to have to do that. So as I look at this, and I, I start looking at my tables here for uh, industrial district. Let's pop this back up. So I've got the industrial district and I look and I'm looking here, trying to figure this out and I see, okay, I've got an industrial district right here. But the thing I notice is that that's got 72% impervious area. That's not what we listed the problem as. We listed the problem as 60%. Now we can do a few things here. We can uh, make some assumptions as to, okay, this is maybe open space, and that's if you'll read some text in the uh, in the uh, in the textbook that talks about that. I could just say, okay, well, this is really open space, so I could go up here and I could use um, this part here with it being the open space and pick a, 
a curve number out of that, um, it, you know, assuming that's good, fair, or poor condition. So it'd be one of these uh, three rows here based on whether it was good condition, fair condition, or poor condition. So I, and that's probably the way I'll go, but I could have also gone and back calculated what the curve number is from the, uh, from this uh, graph right here. So if I go and I, I say, okay, well, uh, if I go to that table and I see that I had, um, you know, basically a value of, um, let's see, do we have a soil group here? So silt, silt uh, one thing I didn't list is what the type of the soil group was. So we had uh, silt soils. And so what is that? That is going to be group A. So that's a group A soil. Okay, so as we go over and look, we could pick off a value here in group A and we could say, okay, well, I'm gonna use 81. And then I could go into my table and with a value of, of 81 right here, I could go across to um, uh, the 72%, which is what we would have had in the chart. So I could go over here to 72%. That's about right in there and go down. No, I'm sorry, wait a minute here. I'm gonna go, let's go all the way over here. 72% is right there. And you'll see that our pervious curve number is somewhere in this range right here. So the pervious curve number is somewhere between 40 and 50. Okay. And trying to back into that. Yeah, so if we had basically a value of 49. Let's just, you, you just assume it's 49 there. So that would have been the pervious curve number for that uh, industrial district would have been equal to 49. And so at that point then, I could go back in with a pervious curve number and with, you know, using percent imperviousness of 60%. So then I start in and I'll use a different color here. So now I'm going up 60% to my value here and at 49, which is right there. And then I go over to in here. Now you can see that um, there's some slop in this, right? So if you're off by two or three values of, uh, you know, you, you said 78 as opposed to, I said 79 or 80, I don't think we're gonna be too far off. And so I would have a value out here of, let's say a uh, curve number or antecedent two for 60% imperviousness, I'd call that 79, okay? And so, um, that's how I could do it. I could also go through and I could have picked off, uh, like I, I mentioned to you, I could have said, oh, okay, let's just go up here and call it open space and call it uh, fair condition. And so I would have picked off a value of 49. You, well, look and see, that's not too bad from where we were before because I back calculated a value of 49 this way as well. So we're not too bad. And then I would just repeated this process, gone in at 60% impervious, gone up to 49 and over and gotten somewhere around 78, 79. Where did you get the, oh, sorry. Uh, where did you get the pervious uh, CNM? Was that given? Yeah, right here. Uh, let me highlight it right here. It's given to you, 60% impervious area. And the 72 was what we originally had coming off the table. So it, it tells you here that the impervious area is 72%. 
you see that percent imperviousness for this industrial district. And so with that, I'm, um, I'm, I'm saying, okay, well, we don't have 72%. The problem gives us it's 60%. So I have to make some adjustments. Okay. Um, let's look at our third problem here, which is a housing development. Oops, don't want that. So I've got a housing development. And it's a uh, placed on untreated pasture ground with fair hydrologic condition underlain by clay soils or clay loams. The new housing results in having 30% impervious area, but rain gutters are disconnected, are not hydraulically connected to drainage system, resulting in unconnected to total impervious area ratio equal to 0 0.5. So determine the curve number or antecedent two. So as I work through this, I noticed that uh, clay loam, that's soil group C. Okay, and I go over to my table of parameters and I look for untreated pasture with fair hydrologic condition. So I look, look in here, I missed it here. Anybody see it? I got too much stuff on my screen, including your, your guys' uh, stuff here pops up for me. Um, Looking for it, looking for it. Untreated pasture. Help me out. What am I? Where, where is it at? Is that under fallow? Fallow on the second table, second part of the table. Uh, first page, second part of the table. Uh, well, fallow row crops, conservation tillage. I'm, I am missing it. Uh, Untreated um, meadow. Seventy-nine. Group C. Non-cultivated agricultural. Should be untreated. When I picked it off, when I was working through the problem the first time, it had a value of seventy-nine for the. Soil group is C, so let's look for a 79. I use specific language in there, no mechanical tree. Okay, here it is right here. Um, non cult untreated pasture. I should say pasture. Here we are. It says non-cultivated agricultural land. I found it here. Yeah, no mechanical treatment right here. So I'm I'm a soil group C. So I'm right here at 79. So I pick that off. So go to table. Um, so for table from 
fable 8.7.3, I get curve number equal to 79. And so I'm going to have to, because I've got some area ratio that's, un, that's unconnected versus connected, so I'm going to start out here with 30% uh, total impervious area. So let me put the highlighter on it. So I get 30%. I go up to my value of 0 0.5. I go over to what I'm going to be looking for is my curve number for the previous area is going to be 79. So I'm going to go over 79, which is about right there. And then I come down and I'm going to call that basically equal to about 83. So I've got a curve number equal to 83 for that value. So, you know, you can see how, how this has progressed. It goes up, over, 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 and then down to come up with that value of 83. Any questions on that? Okay, and then the last thing is um, we've got basically uh, using three examples uh, with um, curve number of, group of, of example one equal to 20% of the watershed. Uh, two has 30% uh, of the watershed and three has 50% of the watershed. What is the composite number? And all I'm doing here is just demonstrating to you that we basically have to, to weight it by uh, area. Uh, and so we've got um, a value, total co uh, composite curve number, we've got uh, 0 0.2 and our first uh, example had 67 for the curve number. 30% is the second value of the second example was 79 for a curve number and 50% was the uh, third part. So that just gives you the weighted value of 79. This, this is sort of just, I just want to make sure that you understand that we go through weighting to get a composite curve number when you got multiple sub areas that have different curve numbers. Okay, well, uh, look, I'm out of time. We'll uh, begin again on Friday, and um, uh, hopefully, um, you did well on the quiz. And, and uh, you know, you can send me an email if there's uh, questions or whatever. So um, we'll be uh, talking to you later. Thanks, everybody.